Hi, everyone. I met Nathan about a year ago when he first started teaching at SciArc. All I knew about him was that he was a fellow Harvard grad and that my partner, Dwayne, was his TA in studio. He was two years below me at Harvard, but I didn't, I didn't know him at the time. And this past fall, we taught one day studio together. After writing some 20 assignments and spending two weeks of late nights installing the 1A project, um, I've gotten to know Nathan quite well. A bit of background on Nathan, he went to Northeastern, then to Harvard. He worked for offices in Boston, such as Machado Zavetti and Office Da. Post Harvard, he also taught at RISD for many years in their undergraduate program. In 2006, he moved to Los Angeles to work for Coney Heisenberg. Reading his CV, in one sense, I feel like I knew many people like him from Harvard with a similar background, with the one difference in that he moved out west. But that difference to me sets him and a small group of us apart from our colleagues on the East Coast. Our years at Harvard were at the end of the Jorge Silvetti era. It was a time where many camps were in serious contention. Spanish modernism still had a stronghold on the school. To move out west, it forced us to be critical of what we were taught and to understand a very different architectural scene. I think because of this, I felt a strong kinship towards Nathan, despite only knowing him for a short period. I have observed in the past four months in teaching with Nathan that he is a great critic, one who is thoughtful, observant, but highly critical and articulate about what he believes in. I did a survey in, in my other studio, not these guys, but um, uh, of the other students that didn't have you. Uh, one student described him on a review as a firecracker. And uh, he's one who's not afraid to argue with other jurors. But at the same time, he's also very open-minded. I've enjoyed teaching and debating with him perhaps ganging up on our fellow Princeton colleague. <laughs> I have also learned that he's passionate about materiality, material connection, and really understand what it takes to put things together. It was a pleasure teaching with him. I hope for many more future opportunities. Please welcome Nathan Bishop. That was the dirt you were digging up on me. It's not as dirty as it got. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Thank you, students, for coming. Thanks for everyone came. Looks like uh, all my good students came. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as Jenny said, uh, yes, I talked to you. It's a picture of me and Mr. Nielsen at midterm uh, <laughs> when he was still speaking with me. Uh, I don't think he knew what was in store for him quite yet. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the studio today. Um, don't be dismayed when I, I'll talk about it next week at a lecture. People will hear about it. Um, because you can all walk down the hall and just take, take a look at it. Um, I did teach at RISD for a number of years, actually both in the grad and in the grad. That's okay. Um, I thought I'd just show you a couple of pictures of a studio that I taught there. Um, and like like Sire of RISD is a place where we're making is part of the pedagogy, and a place where sensing is, is a way of knowing. And um, I think it's been important to me to have that segue and connection between the two schools. Um, this was a final project of a graduate student of mine for a greenhouse for orchids. But um, I'm actually not going to talk about that work today. I'm just going to talk about five projects um, that I did recently, all of which have a variety of scale. Um, and they're in a variety of different places across the planet. Um, but what they share in common is an investment in site and place and relationships that go beyond the constructions themselves. So the first project um, that I'll talk about is the Schneider House in Westport, Mass. After that, I'll talk about uh, Interiors Project, the O'Keefe Residence, um, another built project I did actually while I was a graduate student in Boston. I will talk about the analytic portion of my graduate thesis work um, as a segue into uh, the thinking around uh, 
installation I did with Cone Eisenberg for the Venice Biennale in 2008. Uh, it's now on exhibit in Paris. And then lastly, I'm going to show you a competition that we sadly lost to Office Dog, as Jenny mentioned, the firm I used to work for, so it was very painful to lose. For a new school of architecture, building and planning at the University of Melbourne in Australia, uh, we were also paired with Bill Mitchell, uh, who teaches at MIT. So first, the Schneider Residence. The Schneider Residence is in Westport, Massachusetts, uh, which is on the southern shore of the state. Uh, it's mostly farmland uh, near river, uh, with the occasional kind of typical raised ranch <coughs> development. Uh, the site's there right on the river itself. And you arrive at it, really, it's really interesting, actually. You travel down this really typical cool uh, suburban ranch development, and you get to a cul-de-sac, and you can find this little hidden dirt road right here. You travel down um, the dirt road, go through this low, marshy area, uh, and then up a slight incline to a bluff that looks over the river, and you approach the house pretty much obliquely at an angle. So for me, um, it was really a project that was held between the, the thin verticality of the forest and this taut horizontality of, of the river. Here are some images of the house while it was under construction. It's a really small house. It's 1,400 square feet it's for a family of three. The existing building had burned down. John, uh, Kathy, and Brett, Brett was their teenage son, wanted uh, a new home. This is the approach to the house here. And the view around back towards the river. The, the long axis of the site here runs due east-west. Um, and there's a steep incline towards the, the river on the, um, on the bank there towards the, the dock. Um, there are two neighboring buildings, very small cottage type buildings on the site. Uh, north on the drawing is to the right. And this is a view um, from the site looking west. It's a really stunning place. There's a, a tidal scale of placidity to the landscape. It's very, very quiet. Um, it's also a place of great subtlety where it subtle shifts in. Uh, the textures of the grasses are really quite, quite beautiful. So the, the plan for the house, uh, they're very, very simple. Um, it's a two-car garage, the entry you saw a photo of, and um, then there's this cross axis, uh, the axis of chores, I called it, where uh, you have a small <coughs> uh, closet, the kitchen, uh, pantries, the entry, bathroom and laundry. And then there's a few steps down to a, a study that's made more interior, more private by the, the stair. The dining room and laundry room are adjacent to a deck that then comes down the, the side to the, um, to the river. The second floor is very simple, a very similar kind of long plan fashion. Where you come up the stairs, there's a small balcony looking over the river. That's where that photo was taken from when you're looking across to the western bank. Uh, music room, bathroom, uh, second bedroom for the teenage son, the master bedroom, closet, master bath. So in the beginning, um, as I said, I knew I wanted to establish a set of relationships between the life of the home and the site um, to try and find an order between the, the events of the home and the relationships to each other and situate them in the circumstances of the site. But how do you, how do you set up relationships that go beyond the building itself? Uh, there were multiple iterations and strategies and um, none of them really took hold until um, there was one that came about where I set up a, a threshold between the two conditions. Um, and it really worked because it set up a chain reaction of resultant relationships in the home itself. Uh, relationships between the building, the site, and its inhabitants. 
the, the threshold produced for me a sense of a delay and anticipation uh, as we approach the river, uh, approach one of the woods of the river. This is created basically by two intersecting volumes, the garage in gray and the main house in blue. And the way that this works um, in plan is that there are a series of solid figures, um, kind of dark program. So closets, uh, kitchen cabinets, the fireplace, stair, all produce these um, solid figures in plan that allows the front to be very quiet and placid and mysterious. Um, but more, infor more importantly for me was that um, with that kind of long cross-axis of chores, it oriented the daily life of the house towards the river. Here's a, a section of that. Um, what it really did, the strategy did, was it put the river in a room. It gave the river an interior. Uh, the house works sectionally with the sloping site um, in a series of levels that shift up and down, both upstairs and downstairs. And um, it made it such that even simple acts like washing dishes at the sink, um, became situated in this landscape. So here's a view of a, a study model from the deck looking through the living room up into the, the kitchen. Here's that photo of the same spot during construction. But professional photographers are very expensive. I haven't gotten a photograph just yet. Um, the front of the house becomes very solid, as I said, and um, it plays with light and shadow over the course of the day. So that since the, the long axis of the site runs to east-west, um, the entry becomes a, a vessel of light for uh, the western sunsets over the marsh. And the texture of the house, it's very simple. It's just picking up on the subtle textures in the landscape. So the clapboards on the garage volume are just two and a half inches, while on the main house, it expands to about five inches. This is a view from the dock um, approaching the back of the house at night after some drinks on the boat. It's the music room up in the upper second floor in the corner. A little photo from the front and Brett making dinner. The windows play at night, this very simple kind of dance through the forest. Um, Brett told me the story after they moved in um, that he had grown up on the river his whole life. He'd lived there, but he never felt like he lived on the river until he moved into the house. I thought it was, it was pretty perceptive of a 17-year-old. So if the Schneider house was about a set of um, events in plan, the um, O'Keefe residence was really about a set of uh, events in section. Um, it was an existing townhouse, existing uh, building that they had purchased. Uh, Mark and John said that what they wanted to do was bring about a sense of connection between the floors. Uh, they bought the home in the late 80s and the only thing that kind of made any connection from floor to floor was this horrible pink painted pipe rail. It was, the 80s were a bad time, life on the, it was pretty gross. Uh, but Piper Rail aside, the, the townhouse typology was really interesting for me because it was very inherently episodic. It was uh, life laid over a series of floors, one floor to the next. And early on, what I decided that I wanted to do was intensify this episodic experience. Uh, so rather than working throughout the entire house, I identified a series of microsites that um, I work more tactically to try and intensify the episodic nature of the townhouse type. So essentially, it's a series of cabinets, um, furniture that you can get into. Uh, the little projects, each of them straddle the line between um, architecture and furniture. I became very interested in, in multiple readings at each site, that each little micro project could be read in multiple ways. So they all use plywood that uh, reveals itself both as as thin edge in this uh, little library cabinet. 
thin edge, but also at the same time that it's revealing itself as a thin edge, um, it makes it solid form, so a very thick, massive condition. So it created the possibility for me of, of multiple readings in the same construction, of counter readings within the same construction. So this big, uh, the bookcase here, as you move in through it, uh, starts off as a very solid thing and then reveals itself as a set of very thin shelves that um, in this site, the circumstances of it, is that there's a, a window back here so the thin shelves allow some light to come in from the, the back corner. Uh, John had a collection of miniature chairs too, so we have a nice play of scale as well. So this happens at each level of the townhouse, so that relationships are made floor by floor with the same game of plywood, uh, with that response to the varying circumstances at each location. Uh, so for instance, the, even the bathroom becomes a little cabinet that you step up into, uh, and the medicine cabinet at this back corner there um, breaks open at the corner, revealing something that has been very thick as something that's very thin at this point point where you touch it. Uh, the last little site was the upper study uh, that really just becomes a liner uh, of plywood and that's visible from the master bedroom below. So um, after O'Keefe, uh, I got really interested in episodic, episodic ordering systems but um, was interested in looking at them at a much larger urban scale. Uh, I was reminded of this film by uh, David Lynch, do you know it, Mulholland Drive? Yeah. Uh, it's a film in which characters are constantly shifting identities. So I did this series of studies of um, the film. Uh, it was originally uh, supposed to be a, continue, uh, a series of episodes, television, from one week to the next, you'd see the different episodes. And what Lynch did from episode one to two is use that, that break to naturalize shifts in the identities of the characters. So, um, for instance, from episode one to two, X switches to Y, from two to three, Z switches to U, so on and so forth, and this kind of identity do -si do so as I approach my thesis project, I'm just going to talk about the, the analytic portion of it today, very briefly. I was very interested in looking at um, episodic ordering systems as a, as a way to think about order within fragmented urban conditions. The site was Alewife, which is a peripheral condition, uh, Boston, at the edge of the city just before the western suburbs. Uh, some of you may know that. This road leads out to the western suburbs. Um, it's a pretty typical contemporary edge condition. It's very fragmented with a whole host of, of different um, kind of plates of activity. And the thesis was really arguing for this as a vital condition, uh, not something to be lamented for lack of, of wholeness. What I did was begin to collage together the ways the different groups in the area represented themselves and just collected together how they represented um, themselves. So groups from uh, recreational bike riders, commuters, the city of uh, Arlington that abuts Cambridge, uh, commuter rail. And then amongst it all is this kind of uh, fragmented ecosystem there, there was a series of models made to make visible the fragmentation and the collection of circumstances to see the kind of fragments of experience of each of the different groups have on the site. Uh, and what I was looking for was a more operative form of representation, one that allowed me not just to see the condition, but also propose methods of working. So what came of it um, was that there were a series of maps made that showed the collection of fragments the different groups experienced in the course of their day. Um, suburban teens uh, told me that they, they used the hotel on the, on the 
Interstate as their first time motel that came in at night um, to go into the city. Uh, the soccer moms and the teenagers didn't have quite the same exciting life that the teenagers did. But amongst it all was this um, very vibrant ecosystem. These, uh, these set of parks operated by the Metro District Commission. And it was inhabited by a thriving population of coyotes and deer and um, actually a huge homeless population that, that lived there uh, off the detritus of the strip malls and the, the movie theaters. So the maps and collages were used to identify five sites um, and it proposed using a new, uh, an episodic ordering system um, in these five moments of, of entanglement between the different fragments. Um, is really an alternative to the, the myth of red brick coherence that dominates places like Boston. So essentially what I made was a series of crossover episodes um, where coyotes and commuters uh, were brought into moments of encounter um, that don't presently exist in the site right now. It's really like a, a, a set of staples between the fragments. Now this this interest or way of looking at bigger ordering, bigger ordering systems and um, urban conditions became really useful. When I moved to LA, we uh, and started to work with Koning, with Hank and Julia with Koning Eisenberg, we were asked to do an installation at the Venice Biennale. The portion of the exhibit that we were in um, was called Unternal City. And Aaron Betsky was uh, organizing it. It essentially was the 30th anniversary of the Roman Interrata. You guys, one name probably don't know the Roman Interrata. Uh, but essentially, the Roman Interrata looked at um, the Noli map, which was a map done in 1748 by Jean Baptiste Noli. And it essentially mapped out a figure ground plus public space in the city of Rome. It was originally broken into 12 pieces just because the limits of paper size at the time limited how big the map could be made. Um, so the 12 architects in the, the Interrata in the late 70s basically made operations on representation. Uh, it was representation on top of representation. And 260 years later, another group of 12 architects were asked to look not at the, the center, but rather look at the periphery of Rome. Uh, this is the present day map of Rome. Uh, as you can see, it's much larger. That's Noli Rome today, just in that little red dot. For me, it was a, a problem of representation, you know, how to see the situation in view. Anew. Um, so in a very noble fashion, I looked at a figure ground, but that of a much larger urban region. That's Noli's ground right there. And what I noticed was that there were these series of alternating figures from built to unbuilt. Um, it's very typical for this urban morphology, an old centralized city that has radial lines along which people have built. Um, the only thing that kind of connects it all together is this red line, which was a ring road that they had uh, they put in. It's kind of typical of present day thinking about this kind of morphology. So here's the, the figures of the, the white is the landscape and the, uh, the dark are the clusters of development. And this it corroborated my experience of the place where you move along the ring road from landscape to build the landscape conditions with a couple of rooms thrown in here and there. So the first thing, the problem for me was how do you how do you look at the periphery on its own terms? How do you see it without the center? So the first step that I did was to unroll the ring road. And turn what used to be a, a centralized conceptual condition to something that was laid out on a line and now had a side-to-side -side condition. It, it lost the interior 
concept through the representation. And then, honestly, I didn't know what to do for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Floundered around quite a bit. Um, we looked at social issues. Um, they have a, a problem with prostitution. They have a real problem with uh, trash. Uh, we looked at the gypsy immigration issue, but we were actually told that um, if we tried to deal with the gypsy problem, we wouldn't be allowed to exhibit. <laughs> um, so I tried geometry. What, what happens when you actually unroll the road? What, what geometric condition does that produce? I looked at fragments on a line, um, the pink being the ring road laid parallel to itself. A uh, series of test borings at key sites. Um, but then I finally went back to take a look at the original model and had a closer look and noticed that there were these, these moments of overlap from the actual production of the model itself. These places here, the red push downs. Um, and it suggested to me that maybe there was um, an alternate or a new ordering system for the city. Maybe there were new relationships that could be formed with places that presently have no dialogue with each other. <clears throat> so I re-rolled the ring road and this, this figure emerged. And um, it kind of loops in and out of the center, connecting places that don't presently have connection to each other. It's, it's kind of indifferent to that center. We learned at the time that they were actually proposing another ring road. 200 miles, another 100 miles out, and this just seemed preposterous. Um, so we began making a series of rhetorical <laughs> images. Um, uh, we began imagining that line as a, as a ride, and what that line felt like to, to ride on. We imagined it as a train uh, that you could ride, and station to station became new ways of connecting in the city. So these are images from a um, stills from a, a film that we did. Um, that was our installation, and the end was a film. Uh, and it was about sparking the imagination about new relationships in the city. So <laughs> the story wanted me to play the video. So what this is, we made a, a giant plastic pillow, inflated plastic pillow, and projected onto the backside a video of just holding a camera out of the, the car as you rode down the ring road. And on the front side were a series of, of still images of experiences at different sites along that, that road. Sorry, the train. And it's all just about inspiring new ways of thinking about the city. It's on exhibit actually in Paris right now. So, um, the last project that I want to show you today, very short lecture, um, was our competition entry. The, a new school of architecture at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, we were one of six teams narrowed from 150 entries, uh, and we lost, as I said, to Abbas Da, which is very painful um, since I used to work for them. I was a little upset Monica didn't talk about it when she lectured a couple weeks ago, um, but anyway. Um, we were paired with uh, Bill Mitchell, as I said, and we had some input from Gary Technologies. So the University of Melbourne um, is pretty typical for universities of that age. It's a 
a dense uh, fabric of buildings that um, are interrupted at times by object buildings from the 60s and 70s. That's the existing architecture school. It's a horrible giant block in the northern part of campus. So the series of courtyards really typify the, the ordering system of the, the uh, university. There was a series of uh, courtyards formed by fabric buildings that really played a key part in the culture of the place. They were very highly used by faculty and students. What I found really interesting was that, uh, especially on our site, there were these figural inversions where, um, for the most part, the fabric buildings make very distinct figures uh, in courtyards, but on our site, um, the figure, the figural elements really become these very tall buildings uh, that were put in the 60s and 70s. This one's actually very, very tall. It's a picture of it below. It's actually a very beautiful building. These tiny little feet. It's like a, it's like a deer wandered onto campus. It's very beautiful. Um, the first thing that I noticed was really that um, the building was just in the wrong spot. It's totally in the wrong spot. Um, it, it didn't participate in any of the adjacent relationships. This was a, a point of entry from the street, these low fabric buildings, or these two tall buildings on the north and south side of the site. And um, even though we were asked to design a new school on the present site of the building, we, we didn't. Um, we didn't propose that. Because if you imagine the site empty, um, it really opened up new, new options and new ways to think about relationships. So the very first model that I made was um, about a, it was a sectional model about a set of internal relationships that we wanted to study in the building. Um, there were these double height studios imagined shifted in section in relation to each other uh, to create an internal landscape, really a, a landscape of making uh, that created these long diagonal views throughout the building. We thought of the studio as a very messy place, a place of research. The, the university wanted to become an institution of research um, in Australia. So what you're seeing is also in the sectional model a proposed relationship between uh, faculty offices that are immediately adjacent to studios, which was, was key to me to take the faculty out of a consolidated area of the building and look at a more distributed model that put the faculty and their associated research project in direct proximity to each other, which really produced new relationships between the people who inhabit the building. The other aspect of the, um, the project was to, to make them act of making public. So these, these shifts in section produce these long diagonal views from outside of the building, deep within it, so it becomes this, this landscape of making in the building. We want to link that internal landscape to um, the public view. It's something that schools like the GSD don't do very well. Uh, because they really function on an old model of thinking about what an architecture school is, uh, like a cloister. And we we're trying to de-cloister the, the school. So we investigated a number of different strategies. Uh, this was the, the block strategy. This model is pretty much just an extrusion of that sectional model. And multiple iterations that, that looked at the study of the block. What the what the block did was it produced um, not only the internal relationships we're talking about and its connection from the outside, but by not building on the site and connecting it up to what was the existing student center, it produced one large courtyard as a destination to the, the entry to the school. So the block, it's a, you know, an entire um, 
species of study. There's all these different iterations of what that block could be. This one looked at turning into a more of a dense tartan fabric of spaces. The other scheme was um, the bar scheme, a Z, Z bar scheme. It dealt more with an attenuated set of relationships both between the building and its uh, adjacent site. And the bar won out because it, it did two things. Um, it created two courtyards instead of one and thereby uh, multiplied the fabric of the campus. And it also um, lined these courtyards with the act of making by having the studios immediately adjacent and visible from the, the exterior. Um, I was really interested in the project in multiple ordering systems. Um, here you see the bars are, are actually punctuated with a more a thicker space, a more fluid space. Here, here, and here. Um, part of their program is that their undergrads actually don't get any studio space. They have to find space in the building. So um, what we did was, was scatter that space uh, in these more, more thick, fluid spaces. So again, we distributed those events along the bars, um, producing more chances for encounter and visibility between the different use groups in the building. So there's your, your Z bar scheme. Um, the scheme for me enacted a back end point on the campus. Um, it brought the tall buildings into participation with it, um, which helped to bring those into a bigger set of uh, relationships between the building and the rest of the campus. It also helped to make a transition in scale from the low fabric buildings into a courtyard, low fabric buildings and courtyard. So the section in the end maintains the the diagonal relationships between the studios. Here's the studio here, adjacent faculty offices. Studio, faculty offices. This was library and entry. Some more sections of uh, some of the systems we're thinking about in the building. The, the shifted bars, as I said, create two courtyards, but because we're in the southern hemisphere, um, one bar faces north, the other bar faces south. Uh, here's your, the south bar facing north, and because you know, the sun is in the opposite side of the sky, southern hemisphere, um, it allowed us to start to articulate the differentiation between the two bars, so that the, the south bar got this set of mechanized mover systems that would shift and move over the course of the day, reacting to the sun. Uh, this is a picture of the, the, the skin folds in and out at these places of the informal study. So those places where there are shifts in plan that give the informal studio spaces more interiority also become very frayed on the exterior, creating other uh, moments of social interaction between the building and its surroundings. We really wanted it to be a, a, an armature for experimentation, something very, very wrong, um, and to try and make uh, public the act of making by intersecting it with the pathways of the, the school. So here's that. This is one of the courtyards. Um, it's amazing, it's kind of like the 1960s still in Australia where people actually protest and they're in the, the courtyards of the campus quite a bit. Uh, and what we did was reduce adjacencies between um, the workshops and those, those courtyards so that um, like the stuff you guys do in 1A would be publicized and out in the public along the course of uh, the events of the rest of the, the campus. We also 
want to do this so that the, the expression of the building changed depending on what the research was at the school. So that uh, armatures like this were produced so that depending on what the research was and what the grants they were getting were, um, it became part of the identity of the building. And here's one of the alleyways adjacent to the uh, workshops. Here's that other courtyard actually, um, as you approach from the street. So as you enter into the building and move, move in, um, the bars, as I said, are punctuated with this more fluid space. Um, they're both public spaces moving down into the auditorium, up into the, the public space of the building where the um, students, mostly the undergrads, are working. There's a section through that, that spot where the two bars connect and cross. So the, that space becomes very, very fluid, uh, like, like drapery. It's, it's almost as if the landscape has been pulled up into the building in those areas. There's a section through the, the thin part of the bar, um, and now looking towards the south. Again, that space becomes very deformed and, and thick. And uh, just two more views. This is the Double Height studio space with the adjacent faculty offices looking down into the courtyard. So um, we lost the competition. And, um, it was pretty upsetting. I, I think I think our university wasn't ready for the kind of changes we we're proposing between the faculty and the students. And I also think they weren't very happy about not building on the site that we had proposed, uh, that they had asked us to. So I guess we'll just find them next time. That's all I got. Thank you.